All right, forerunner, say forerunner. Tonight's title is Declaring the End from the Beginning, and I want to pray. Father, I just thank you, God, for the forerunner word that you've given us, Father, and how that you're saturating our lives, God, with who you have called us here in Florida. We are called to be forerunners. We're not called to be pessimists or lagging behind or frustrated about the future. We are the forerunners who create the future that you have designed. And God, that we've been called to stand in the gap, to make up the hedge, to like Jeremiah, who, and I now I just got a brand new word for the next message on the forerunner, like Jeremiah who tore down, throw down, tear down, to build and to plant. Jeremiah 1.10. And Father, I thank you, God, for that anointing, the Jeremiah anointing of a forerunner, the, the uh, Josiah anointing of a forerunner father, the John the Baptist anointing of the forerunner who foreran Jesus. And God, we are forerunning you coming into our nation, you coming into the state of Florida. And we will not relent, we will not keep silent until we see the shallow. Do we see the revival, the awakening come to America, come to Florida, come to our families? You've promised it, Lord. And we believe, God, you're going to do it. Lord, I just say to you that your reputation is at stake. Father God, I just ask you to step up to the plate and do what you said you were going to do. And Father, I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Daniel, if you could put up that. Uh, I know I didn't ask you to. You may not be ready, but that we are a forerunner people. That would be great. Thank you, Lord. There we are. Say it with me. We are a forerunner people, a tribe of warriors. We have been called to prepare the way of the Lord to make a pathway in the wilderness for Yahweh. We are the fire starters, the harbingers, the trailblazers, and the pathfinders. Forerunners are those who go ahead of others where no man has gone before. They are the visionaries that see the end from the beginning and say, let's go. I am a forerunner. Amen. Tonight we're going to talk about the forerunning aspect of declaring the end from the beginning because a forerunner sees the end results. Man, the glory just fell in here. I, everything is a haze right now. Ooh. Forerunners declare the end from the beginning. I just need to pause a moment because the presence of God just can't, the glory came in here and I'm kind of, I'm kind of in a different place right now. Thank you, Father. In Isaiah 46.10, and you can just stay there on that carpet if you want to. In Isaiah 46.10, the prophet prophesies and he talks about who we are. It talks about who God is, but this is who we are. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things which, things which have not been done. Saying, my purpose will be established. And I will accomplish all my good pleasure. When you read this same scripture out of the Amplified, it says this. Declaring the end and the result from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that have not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand. And I will do all my pleasure and my purpose. And the reason a forerunner is a forerunner is because they have seen the end from the beginning. They don't necessarily know how they're going to get there, but they know what the end is. And so they begin the process, they begin the work to get to the end results. Forerunners are really a pragmatic type of people. That they go for the results. They don't care how the results happen. This is one of the things about a forerunner you need to understand, and I may be getting a little bit ahead of myself, 
forerunner is not a micromanager. A forerunner actually decrees the end and says, let's go. And he doesn't care how you get there as long as you're on the move to get there. One of the things I can't stand is when people try to micromanage me. I cannot stand that. I had a guy, when I worked at the paper mill in Alabama, I, we, were down, we were shut down to clean. About twice a year they would shut down for either 24 hours or 48 hours to clean things up. And they had me on a, 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 where the paper rolled out. It was in the, uh, what was called the board mill, and we made food board uh, like Morton Park pot pie bar boxes and stuff like that. But we made just the paper. We didn't make the box. And I was up there cleaning and working, and my boss was down on the ground. I was the only one up there, and he was standing there just looking at me like this. And he just stood there and stood there and stood there. And I'm wondering, why in the world is John that staring at me like this? So I said, I'm going to break this up. So I walked over and I said, John, can you, because I was way up on top of a scaffold. I said, can you hand me this? And he would have to put it on a pole and hand it up to me. So he did it. He put it on a pole, handed it up to me. And then he, but he went back to staring just like this, looking up at me. And I said, I'm going to break this up. I go back to him a second time. Hey, John, I need this over here. I forget what it was. And he went and got it for me. But after I asked him twice to do something, off he goes. I don't like to be micromanaged. And forerunners are not micromanaging type people. They see the vision and they go for the vision. They see, they've heard from the Lord. They've heard what God says. It may not be the right way, but they'll find what the right way is because they'll even try the wrong way if it seems like it'll get them to the end result. At least they're moving. Exactly. But the word here in Isaiah 46.10 where it says, Declaring the end from the beginning. I'm hoping that you'll write this down, especially in your Bible, because I have it written down in my Bible. The word end is a very interesting word in the Hebrew language. And you have to understand that the Hebrew language is not a technical language like Greek is. It's a poetic type language. And so this particular word in the Hebrew is akarith, A-C-H-A-R-I-Y-T-H. I'll spell it again. A-C-H-A-R-I-Y-T-H. And in the Hebrew way of thinking, it's like a man rowing a boat. He backs into his future. So when you look at this scripture here, when God says, declaring the end from the beginning. It's as a man begins rowing the boat, he's going toward the end result. But what he's rowing from is the word that the Lord released. Need to get that. He's not rowing according to the circumstances that are behind him. Because when you row a boat, you row like this. And if you do like this while you're rowing, you start going in circles. And you don't want to go in circles. And I've got a whole story about Cheryl taking us in circles one time, but I won't go there. <laughs> but she didn't know how to row. But anyway, the word akarith is as a man rowing boat. So here's what happens. When you get a word from the Lord, when you, God gives you a vision, He gives you a word, He gives you a dream, He gives you a promise, you're rowing then. And you begin rowing from that word or that promise. And you never look this way. Your reference point is what you just received from the Lord. And that's how you row. And if you look at where you're going, you're going to fall into some pitfalls. Or you're going to go in circles. Because you're trying to turn around and row. And inevitably you'll go in a circle. So when the Lord releases a word, He releases a promise... He releases a dream, you take that and you start rowing. Now, how do, how do forerunners row? Forerunners have God targets. Let me say that again. Forerunners have God targets. They don't have people targets. They have God targets. It will include people. But these are God targets. So forerunners have God targets when they've heard from the Lord they begin rowing according to the God target. Say God target. 
Forerunners see the end and the results of the labor that is involved. This is why a forerunner keeps their eyes on the God target. God target number one. This is how you stay there. Dwelling in the shadow. There's a shadow anointing that is released from the Lord when you dwell in that shadowy place with Him. One of the things that hinders the body of Christ and hinders people today is they don't spend time under the shadow of the Most High. And when I was young back in Alabama, I was, somebody posted something on, on, on one of the internet the other day, and it was uh, uh, hauling hay. Anybody here ever hauled hay out of a field? Bales of hay. There's one. There's one. There's one. There's one. There's one. There's one. And here's one. There's nothing hotter. It's in the middle of summer, and you've got a 90-pound, 80 or 90-pound bale of hay that you're having to throw up on the back of a trailer about this tall. And, and, and the trailer's not stopping. You're running alongside, and you're grabbing the hay, and you're throwing it up there like that. And, uh, but I remember when it was over, the first thing that we did was we looked for the shade or a barn. I remember the last time I hauled hay was for Cheryl's uncle. And he rewarded us with a big old watermelon. I ate a whole watermelon by myself. In the barn that we had loaded the hay in, not only do you load it on the trailer or on the truck, when you get to the barn, you've got to put it in the barn as well. This is back before automation. And, and so we hunted the shade. We hunted the secret place where the shade was so we could cool off. But the thing that troubles most believers is they're not spending time. It's not the devil. They're not spending time in the shade with the Lord. And this is a place that we need to be. It's the quiet place with the Lord. We get in that shade with Him and all of a sudden we're refreshed in His presence because we're in the shadow, the secret place of the Most High. Psalms 91, he who dwells in that secret place will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, he is my fortress, my God in whom I trust. A thousand may fall at my side and ten thousand at my right hand, but it shall not come nigh my dwelling. Hallelujah. Go read that Psalm 91 again. I posted the other day, I, I, I said, just say this. Everybody decree this. The gas shortage is over. I've not been to one gas station that didn't have gas. When I get there, it has gas. I've been decreeing the gas shortage is over. God protect our resources. You may have been to a gas station that has ha hasn't had gas, but I haven't been to one. Hallelujah. Woo. Forerunners dwell in the God target of the shadow. Forerunners have a target of hearing the Lord. They want to hear from Him. Man, I heard from Him. I got so excited about a dream the guy had today. It got, it got sent to me. I'm not going to go in details because it'll probably come out soon. Public, you know, and I want them to be able to develop. But I found out today that 528 hertz is a frequency of love and a frequency of miracles. And when I saw that, I said, God, we have a 528 here in Florida. A 528 highway. B-line. Now called the beach line. Yeah, it used to be called that. And, uh, and but it's 528, highway 5. When I saw that, I said, Lord, I've actually bought a tuning fork a 528 tuning fork today, I'm going to ride up and down a 528 and I'm going to ring the tuning fork and I'm going to decree love and I'm going to decree miracles. I'm going to decree the love of God. I'm going to decree the miracles of God. Now, that's what forerunners do. That's what they do. People are going to ride on that highway after we get done and they're going to say, I've decided not to get a divorce. They're going to ride on that highway and their, their heart's going to be healed or their diabetes is going to leave them in Jesus' name. Because the forerunners have been there. 
I'm a highway kind of guy. I've, I've done highways my entire last 20 years. God targets here in the Lord. And forerunners only move when the Lord says move. This is important. Forerunners only move when God says move. If God says sit down, forerunners will sit down. And they won't try to make things happen. Listen to this. Even Jesus did this, and this is a good lesson from Jesus. In John 8, 38, the Passion Translation, the tr Yet the truth I speak, I've seen and received in my Father's pleasant presence. But you are doing what you learned from your Father. So he's saying there that what I speak, I've seen and received from the Father's presence. That's important. Jesus didn't operate outside the Father's presence. Think about this for a moment. Remember the man at the gate, beautiful, who was healed when Peter and John came up and said, silver and gold we don't have? Jesus walked by this man and never healed him. Think about that. Think about this. There were many sick at the pool of Bethesda, but only one man received his healing that day. Think about that for a moment. You only, forerunners only move according to how the Lord is moving. And this is very important as a forerunner because people will try to bring you into all kinds of things that you have no business getting into. It's not yours. Maybe theirs. You know, I love the message on the courts of heaven, but I don't go there because it's not my message. I told Robert Henderson, Robert Henderson and I had a discussion about it about three months ago, maybe four. And that, yeah, it was about, it was in February. That everybody's trying to do the courts of heaven, but Robert is the one who's carrying the anointing to see it happen. Wow, it got kind of quiet in here. I upset somebody. You just have to get over it. Look at John twelve forty nine. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. This is how forerunners operate. They only operate by what they hear the Father say and what they hear the Father speak. They don't operate outside of that realm. John 5, 19, Passion Translation. So Jesus said, I speak to you eternal truth. The Son is unable to do anything from Himself or through His own initiative. I only do the works that I see the Father doing, for the Son does the same works as His Father. Listen at that. It's a powerful scripture. Now, several years ago when Levi, our oldest grandson, was when he was small, about this tall, I was outside one day working on our car. I had the hood up, and it was hot, and I had my shirt off. I had shorts on. I had a wrench in my back pocket, a greasy rag in my back pocket working on our car. And, um, and so Levi says, Papa, what are you doing? I said, I'm working on the car, Levi. So Levi takes his shirt off. He reaches in my toolbox, puts his tool in his back pocket, takes his shirt off, pokes his belly out like that, <laughs> and starts saying, I'm just like Papa. I wish I had a picture of that. I'm just like Papa. You see, we're to be just like our Heavenly Father. I took him fishing one time. I took him and his dad fishing down to Kissimmee State Park one time, fishing for bass. And they, they used to have this spillway that ran across. And whenever the spillway was running, usually after storms or hurricanes, when it had a lot of water, the spillway would run. And you could go down there and... I, I've never been down there when the spillway was running. I didn't catch at least one five-pound bass. I've caught many smaller than that. So anyway, I was fishing in the middle. Jason was fishing over here. Levi was fishing over here. It was on a bridge overlooking the spillway. And so I threw my line out there with a shiner on it, and bam, my line went down like that, and I pulled up a three-pound bass. And uh, I grabbed that thing, and I put it on the, uh, the stringer. That was back when you could keep anything you know I didn't have any size limit today they do and we practice conservation too we catch and eat and uh 
And, uh, <laughs> and so I baited my hook back up, and I threw it back out there, and bam, my line went down. I caught another one. I had a five-pound bass that time. I brought it in, put it on the stringer, and Levi, his bottom lip, man, is hitting the ground. He's over here, Jason's over here. They, neither one have caught anything, but God's about to teach me something. And I threw it back out there a second time, and bam, my line went down, and I caught another three-pound bass. And, brought, and, and that time, before I brought it in, I caught it, and Levi's over. I said, Levi, come here. I said, bring this bass in. And Levi, all of a sudden, he starts reeling that bass and bringing that bass in. He says, help me, Papa. I says, no, I'm not going to help you. You've got to bring it in by yourself. So he was probably six or seven years old at the time. Levi brought in that three-pound bass we put it on the stringer and then as I'm baiting the hook back up he comes by me slaps me on the back he Paul Paul me and you we on fire <laughs> and the Lord taught me something about passing things on to another generation giving them a chance to catch fish giving them a chance to be discipled by the older generation. The Lord was teaching me something that day that I will never, ever forget. And, uh, and it's important that forerunners grab that knowledge because there are going to be people as you forerun who will run, come up alongside of you, and when they come alongside of you, you don't put them behind you, you put them beside you. I've never believed in passing a torch to a generation. I believe in bringing a generation up beside you and letting them work with you to see God move. Because when, when you, they talk about passing the baton, and they say, well, I had people tell me this. They said to me, they said, uh, I, had a, I had a vision the other day that like Elijah, you passed away and, and you gave me your mantle. And I said, you better get it now because I'm not giving it to you unless you work for it. And... Uh, I, that happened one time in the Bible. We want to make a doctrine out of it. When you get in the New Testament, you never see that happening. You see Paul bringing up Timothy and Lydia, and you see Barnabas and John Mark coming alongside of each other is the way the New Testament operates. It doesn't operate when somebody goes away, you pass them a, a, a baton. They get it now. I will, Tangie. Thank you. Now listen to this. This is another thing that forerunners need to understand. Forerunners pick their battles. They don't let somebody else pick it for them. Forerunners pick their own battles. Now Jesus talked about this. He said when a king goes to war, he counts the cost as to whether or not he can win when he goes into the war. Or if someone is building a house, they count the cost to see if they have enough money to finish the house. That's important. Because you'll get discouraged if you don't have the funds to finish the house. Wow. So you, forerunners, pick your battles. You pick battles that has success as the end result. Should have been a drum roll on that. Forerunners, pick battles that have success as an end result. I've had people in Florida because of my influence in the state. And most of you didn't know me back then. But I've had people from all over the state say, we need you to do this. We need you to do that. And I said, God's going to have to tell me. When the greening hit the orange industry, they said, we need to have some prayer strikes for the orange industry. And I agree, I want the orange industry to succeed. But I am not taking on every battle that somebody has. If you have that burden, you do it. Praise God. That's a good word. I don't care where you come from. So you don't pick every battle that comes along. You need to take a lesson from Josiah, 2 Chronicles 35, verses 20 through 24. After this, when Josiah had set the temple in order, Necho, king of Egypt, came up to make war at Carchemish on the Euphrates, and Josiah went out to engage him. But Necho sent messengers to him, saying, what have we to do with each other, O king of Judah? I am not coming against you today, but against the house with which I am at war. And God has ordered me to hurry. Stop for your own sake from interfering with God who is with me, so that he will not, 
so that he will not destroy you. However, Josiah would not turn away from him, but disguise himself in order to make war with him, nor did he listen to the words of Necho from the mouth of God, but came to make war in the plain of Megiddo. The archers shot King Josiah, and the king said to his servants, Take me away, for I am badly wounded. So his servants took him out of the chariot and carried him in a second chariot, which he had, and brought him to Jerusalem, where he died and was buried in the tombs of his fathers. All Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. Josiah's time was not up, but Josiah ended his time. God was not finished with Josiah, but Josiah ended his time because he took on a battle that was not his. And even King Necho gave him the word of the Lord, this is not your battle. I'm not here to fight with you. You go home unless something bad happens to you. And it did. And so forerunners pick their battles. They don't run into every battle that's going on. You have to pick those battles. And there may be a time that you'll win, or there may be a time that it will be won in the future, and you may not see the end result as a forerunner. But you started a process that maybe somebody else will pick up and begin running with it also. It's a good word there. Forerunners along the way to achieving the God goal, they will make adjustments in what works and what doesn't work. If it's not working, stop spinning your wheels and grab something that is working. Do something that works. Don't spin your wheels in something that's not working. So forerunners make adjustments. Say make adjustments. See, there's nothing wrong with that. If there's something that you're doing that's not getting the success results of the end, then just go ahead and stop. Go ahead and stop and then find out what the Lord wants to do. Sometimes you need to pull away or disengage and go and spend some time in the secret place. And don't let soul ties keep you doing something that is no longer getting results. Because a soul tie will tie you in to an individual or tie you into a region or tie you into a cause that maybe God is not with that. I'll share something else with you, and this may seem kind of harsh, and I don't mean it to be. But many, sometimes the enemy sends you people to distract you, to get you off course, to get you off track. And there's been many people who we have tried to help over the years, and we pour our lives into them for 10 years. And nothing changes. At some point, you have to release and let go. So that they can, because a lot of times when you try, when you keep pouring into somebody for 10 years, sometimes you're enabling that person to be who they are. And sometimes you've got to let them go. I know Wendy, our spiritual daughter, lives in Lakeland. Her husband was in Teen Challenge when I came to Florida. And he was a drug addict. And, uh, but the way he got in Teen Challenge was that he got in jail and then he got out on bond, but his parents didn't bond him out, but he came home. And his mom did the hardest thing that she'd ever done in her life. She said, you can't come in my house. And she didn't allow him in because he had to come to a place where he stood on his own two feet. And if he had, sweet Jesus, if she had let him in, she would have been enabling him. And he finally came to a place where he stood on his own two feet. The judge sentenced him to teen challenge. And he spent a year or two years in there. I, I don't forget how much. But it was a year and two years that he needed to have the word pressed into him heavily, which is what they did. Forerunners will engage help to accomplish the goal. They will say, come alongside me, help me. And I want to say this because we were, some intercessors and I were talking about this the other day. I want to call out to the intercessors, come to Satellite Beach. We need your help. We need people who can pray, who don't mind praying around the clock, 
who will pray in the middle of the night. We're not talking about mamby-pamby prayers or need-oriented people. We're talking about warriors. We need some warriors to come to Satellite Beach and help us pray because we have a God mandate here to bring awakening and revival from this place into all of the state of Florida. So come and help us. Come and help us. Come and help us. You see, forerunners know to engage people. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, it says two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. And a cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. It's one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. That when people begin working together instead of get against each other. And this is one of the things that I really despise about some of our denominations today. How that within the church, they're taught to work against one another. The deacons are taught to work against the pastor, especially in the Baptist church. Oh, you shouldn't name names, Brother King. You need to know this. They're taught to work against their pastor. And you know, back in the 60s and 70s, when you saw the deacons standing out in front of the Baptist church, do you know why they were there? Keep the black people out. Because I, I, I was raised in Demopolis, Alabama, 50 miles from Selma. I know why they were there. And so you have that mentality in a lot of churches and i've been to churches where the the elders ran the pastor i know one pastor got put six month investigation under the sheriff's department because he the the church didn't have a paypal account so he created one when he got there and they he didn't ask the elders i told him i said i preached at his church i haven't been back and uh i told him i said man i wouldn't put up with that not one minute the elders put him under six months investigation to, to come to find out that all the funds was going into the church's bank account. It's crazy. A forerunner doesn't put up with shenanigans like that. A forerunner does not put up with political aspect of the church. Y'all behave, Cheryl. So that's why I'm calling for the intercessors to come and help us. We need your help. We need your help. We need to change the atmosphere over this region. Some of you may not know it, but Brevard County, I was always told, was a, a region that didn't have a lot of violence in it. Go and download the app called Newsbreak and put it to local, and you'll find out this is one of the violent, most violent counties in Florida. I didn't know it because I'm stuck here in Satellite Beach. But just down here on A1A, south of here, a few weeks ago, there was a shooting. And what the Lord is saying when all that's going on, I'm glad I'm on that app now because the Lord is saying it's time to pray. It's time for the intercessors to arise and begin praying over their county that God has placed them in. 528 frequency is what we've got to have. See, forerunners are in covenant with God for kingdom purpose. They're in communion with the Father. I'm not just talking about taking communion. They're in communion with Him. If you want to get in communion, when, when Marsha, get on Facebook when Marshall does these Facebook uh, worship things almost every morning, I think. Just tune in. Just tune in and listen. Because He's bringing you into communion with the Father. Or if you don't want to do that, put on some Rick Pino or put on something just to hear what the Lord is saying in worship. Here's something that is really strong on my heart, and this, I'll bring this to one of my many closings with this. Forerunners are married to the land. They love where God has placed them. If you don't love where God has placed you, you'll always have your emotional bags packed and ready to go somewhere else. And I didn't say this just for you. I didn't even know you was going to be here tonight when I put this together. But when I moved to Florida, we were all excited about moving to Florida, coming down here, 
and we moved to Central Florida, began pastoring a church, and all hell broke out against Cheryl and I and our family. I mean, it was just several years of hell. And uh, we were living, we were, we were not living from paycheck to paycheck. Paycheck two weeks ago had already been up, burned up in the first week. And, uh, and, and we were just barely making it. We ate peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for two weeks one time. I'll never forget that. That's all we had, you know. And uh, it's, it's, I know how to be a bound and I know how to be a base, but I like a bound a whole lot more than a base. I can tell you that. And it didn't. And then all of a sudden, Cheryl had two accidents within one year. I mean, two major accidents. She, she had to have plastic surgery on her face, and most of you don't even know that. You wouldn't even know just to look at her that she had plastic surgery because they did such a good job on putting my baby back together. And, uh, and I watched him. I'm glad he did a good job. And, uh, and man, I just, I get my, and in, inside me, I was saying, thinking, I've got to get out of here. This is not where I'm, uh, I'm to be, but I knew the Lord had sent me. So I'd go talking to the Lord about me going somewhere else. And the Lord said, he, he said to me, you're going to be here a long time. Just like that. Emphasis on the long. And I said, please, God, let me get out of here. I don't want to be here. It was rough. And then we started, I started flying airplanes, and I started doing the missions in the Caribbean and in the Bahamas. And the Lord speaks to me about doing a strong mission outreach in the remote islands of the Bahamas, which we did for five years. And we saw tremendous, tremendous results. And the last year that I was there, persecution broke out against me. I was going, you know, anywhere from seven to eight times a year. And strong persecution broke out against me. People were trying to run me out of the Bahamas. They had gone to the, uh, the government and trying to get me out through the customs and that sort of thing to not let me in. And, uh, and so... I'll never forget that last time I was there. Just the whole, everything turned like that. The favor that I had, the anointing that I had, bam, was no longer there. And when you start seeing that, something's going on, and it may not be the devil, it may be God. And I remember coming back to Florida. This was in 2000. And I remember landing in Fort Pierce. Cheryl and I were talking about Fort Pierce Customs. There's a customs there for small aircraft coming from the islands and uh and there you were guilty until you proved yourself innocent you were guilty of everything until you proved yourself innocent and uh but i never will forget coming back to fort pierce getting out of the airplane laying on the ground and kissing the ground and somehow that year god supernaturally married me to the state of Florida. Here's what happened. The man who always wanted to leave and go somewhere else all of a sudden became firmly planted because now I'm married to a state. I'm married to this state. This state is married to me. The blessings of this state are upon me. And this state has many blessings. And I need to pray for you before you leave tonight and place the blessings of the state of Florida upon you in Jesus' name. And the blessings of the state are upon me. All of a sudden, my authority level went off the chain because now I'm married to Florida. You see, as a, as a person who's married to your wife, when Satan attacks my wife, I don't put up with it. I go and I pray for her. I take dominion. I take authority. Oh, you poor pitiful thing. You want me to get you some ibuprofen or some Tylenol? Now, I will get that far, but along the way of getting that, I'm going to walk up to her and I'm going to say, Randa Shonda Dabakataha. I'm in covenant with you, and this sickness is not coming nigh my covenant partner in Jesus' name. And that's how you do it. That's what forerunners do. Yeah. It's what we do. It's what forerunners do. They just don't let the sickness hang around in the house. It may come, but you don't have to keep it there. Amen. 
You know, I, I had the China virus. I don't call it COVID. I call it the China virus. I had the China virus attack me, but you know what? I won. Through my wife praying for me. And, and you know what? I, I had some of Job's friends that told me, said, if you get this, you're going to die because of all the underlying problems you have. This is going to kill you if you get the, the China. They called it COVID. I said, I will not. I will not. But I, the other day I told, did y'all see my son and daughter-in-law that was here the other day? You see their hands raised? See, that was the prodigal that came home. And I told them the other day, because I told them my story of being in, having the, the uh, visitation from Jesus on February the 1st when I was in the hospital after the ablation. Well, he, he invited me to go to heaven and live in heaven with him. And, uh, and I had never experienced the heaven presence nowhere, anytime, not in a church service anywhere, like I experienced here. And I, but I told them the other day, I said, Guys, I want you to know, I'm not afraid to die. All the fear of death is completely off of me. I have no fear whatsoever. As a matter of fact, there's a part of me now because of that visitation. I'll have to tell you about it. Because of that visitation, there's a part of me that wants to be with him right now. Because I've experienced heaven. I've experienced the presence. So if I was to fall over right now, and give up the ghost, the ghost is going to be with the Lord. And I told my son and daughter in love, I said, don't you, don't you fret over me. It's not my time. I know it's not my time. But I'm not afraid when my time comes. I'm not afraid whatsoever. Listen, forerunners love where God has placed them. And until you love it, you'll never have the authority to change it. Let me say that again. Till you love where God has placed you, you'll never have the authority to change it. So you have to unpack. Forerunners don't carry emotional baggage. They cast emotional baggage off. When, something, when, when the enemy tries to bring an emotional bag back around, forerunners remind the enemy, that's already been dealt with, it's under the blood, it's been forgiven, I'm moving on. They don't hold on to hostility. Forerunners don't. You can't forerun holding on to hostility. You know what you, what you do when you hold on to trauma and hostility? You sit in neutral and you do absolutely nothing. Woo! Authority increases to bring transformation when you're married to the land. If you are divorced from the land, you'll have no authority to change it. If you divorce yourself from your city, Divorce yourself from where God has placed you. You'll have no authority to change it. You see, we need to come to the place to realize that where I am now, God has placed me here, and I'm going to do His work where He's called me to do, come hell or high water. This is where God has put me. I am an overcomer. I have authority. Listen to this. In the back of your mind, this is good for all of us, that enemy will attack you. Your time is up here. You're done here. You're finished here. I've heard all of that sob story from the enemy before. All that is is an enemy pity party. And you would love for somebody to join you, but ain't nobody going to want to join your pity party. I need to find me another church. That's pity party. Pity party. Want to go to another church. They want a new church. They want a new boss. They want a new town. They want a new spouse. All of that. I had a lady come... Years ago, when we were in Central Florida, she needed counseling. This is one of the reasons you don't want me to counsel you. She come in, and she says, I feel like God wants me to divorce my husband and marry this guy up north in Illinois. And I, I, I'm getting there, Cheryl. And I said, really, I was intrigued by this, you know, that God would tell somebody to divorce their spouse. Yeah, the Lord told me he wants me to divorce my husband and marry this guy. I said, well, tell me about this guy. Oh, we were high school sweethearts. And I said, just that. I said, uh-huh. I said, let me tell you why you're here. You had sex with that man in high school, 
and you have a soul tie to him, and that soul tie has now come to visit you, but the reason you're here is so I can cast that demon out of you. And she got up and ran out. She kept her demon. Truth will set you free or either run, cause you to run from it. You see, I, we have to unpack our emotional bags. I'm married to this state. I love this state. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not leaving Satellite Beach. This is where God has called me. We need to saddle up our horses. We have trail to blaze. Come on. You know what I'm talking about. We have a trail to blaze. You know, you, oh, whip ye like men, is what the word says. Strengthen yourself in the Lord and in the power of his might. Cast off these pity parties and these slumber parties that you have with the enemy at night. Cast those things off and begin dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. Begin strengthening yourself in the Lord. Begin saying, I am more than a conqueror. I am an overcomer. I overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of my testimony. I love not my life unto death. A thousand may fall at my side, ten thousand at my right hand, but it's not coming nigh my dwelling because I have made the Most High my refuge in Jesus' name. In Isaiah 62, verses 1 through 5, and I could preach on this right here, just this five verses here for another hour. For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. See, when you're in covenant with something, you don't hold your peace about it. That's why you've heard me tell the story of Cheryl and the dementia that ran in her family. And now that now she has no chance of getting the dementia. But... And if anyone should have gotten it, it should have been her because she's most like her dad in every way. The way she, the, her, her, her body, the way she looks, uh, her demeanor is a lot like him. And, uh, and so she should have got it. But she didn't. But I would not let it come nigh the woman I am in covenant with. When she would go home to Alabama and her and her brothers and sisters had been, and I didn't go, had been talking about it, she had come back home and I could see this cloud hanging over her. And she would walk in the house and she didn't have to say a thing. I, I looked at her and I said, y'all have been talking about that disease. Yeah, we talked a lot about it. And I would just break that stuff off. You can't bring that in my house. You're in covenant with me. We're married. You, I'm not going to have a wife that falls into dementia. And then she goes and gets tested to find out whether or not she's going to have it. And they say, you're not going to have it. This is how, this is what forerunners do. They forerun the way. They're married. For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest. Until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a lamp that burns. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will name. You shall also be a crown of glory in the land, of, uh, in the hand of the Lord, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no longer be termed forsaken, nor shall your land any more be called desolate, but you shall be called Hepzibah. Do you know what Hepzibah means? Delightsome. It says, my, the Lord says, my delight is in you. And you shall be called, what? Beulah, your land Beulah. What does that mean? Married. Married. Do you know that God is married to the land? That God loves the land. Everybody think that God is going to forsake this earth. He is not going to forsake this earth. We've been taught a wrong eschatology for many, many years. That God is going to forsake the earth and the earth is going to burn up and no, we're just going to receive a new heaven and a new earth. He loves this earth. I'll tell you something else. Yeah. This earth looks like heaven, but it's not in a redeemed state yet. Heaven and earth look just alike, except earth is not in a redeemed state yet. They have streets, they have rivers, they have trees, they have birds. All of those things. 
to have animals? Just think about that. And so everybody's thinking they're going to go sit on a cloud and pluck on a harp. No, you're going to walk around on streets of gold. Pull up a little piece of it there. Man, look at that. You see, we're married to this land. God's married to it. It says, For the Lord delights in you, for as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. You see, the sons, I'm just getting some more revelation. The glory just came in here again. The sons are the forerunners because they love the land. They love this land. Tomorrow, I'm making a trip to go and pray. It's about a three-hour trip to go and pray in a portion of our state because that's what forerunners do. I do a six-hour round-trip drive, but I'm going to put it in two parts and visit my son while I'm there. But we're going to do a prayer strike to raise the banner and say, No hurricanes! We're going to say the word of the Lord according to the vision I had a little over a year ago now. We're going to release that over the Bay of the Holy Spirit. We're going to say, Bay of Holy Spirit, become who you are. We're going to decree it. Woo! In verse 6, I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent. Forerunners are watchmen. Yeah, they're on the move, but they're also watching. You need to understand that. Forerunners are watchmen, but they're also on the move at the same time. Because they see what the Lord's doing. As a, as a watchman in today, you don't have to sit on a watchtower. You can be on the move. Watching, praying. Jesus told us to watch and pray. I always tell single people when they are in church, when the pastor says, bow your head, let us pray, you keep your eyes open because there may be someone there you could meet. So watch and pray. I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent. And give him, give the Lord no rest till he establishes, until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. And I know that mentions Jerusalem there, but I'm going to call it Florida right for right now. Don't you give the Lord no rest. You just keep hammering, awakening revival in Florida. I decree and a, a supernatural move of God across this state. Lord, you hear my words in Jesus' name. I call right now the angels of heaven to be dispatched across this state. I'd release right now 10,000 angels across this state to, to begin to forerun even before us, to bring in the harvest of the prodigals. Harvest angels go forth into Florida and bring the harvest of souls in, in Jesus' name. Bring the prodigals. Bring the sons and the daughters. Bring my sons and daughters from afar. We decree to the north, the south, the east, and the west that the children will come home to the Father in Jesus' name. Come on home. Come on home. Come on home. I'll sing that Milan Lefebvre song sometimes over the, over the prodigals. I'll sing, I'll sing in the atmosphere. Come on home to the Father. Come on home to the Son. Come on home, the battle's over. Christ has won. You see, the prodigals are in a battle. And we think they're just being rebellious. They can't get back until you and I not give him any rest. And he begins to break the bondage that's on their life. And then they start making their turn 
toward home in Jesus' name. And when the prodigal comes home, they're not coming home to you. They're coming home to the Father. They're coming home to the Son. They're coming home to the Holy Ghost. And don't make them say a thousand Hail Marys before you let them in your house. When they come home, you throw your arms out. You bring them in. And you say, this my son was once dead. Now he's living again. You kill the daddy calf. You put a robe on their back, ring on their fingers, shoes on their feet. And not ever let a word of condemnation come out of your mouth. You forgot what it was like to be a sinner. Righteous one, you. Yeah, we've forgotten what it's like to be a sinner. Sinners do what they do. They sin. But righteous people sin when they judge others. When they talk bad about others. You can go in the middle of this county somewhere and somebody that knows about our church, they'll talk bad about Kingdom Gate. I ain't got time for you. I don't have time for that person. I'm moving forward. When you want to talk positive about Brevard County, about my state, then we can run together. Amen, Brother Ken. Glory to God.